Lisa, I've been wanting to talk with you about this case since uh, Curtis Reeves is an ex-SWAT team member. Or he was in charge of a SWAT team um, during his time as captain of the uh, Tampa Police Department. And you're a former SWAT team member and law enforcement officer. So we have a, we have a former law enforcement officer retired. He was about 71 at the time that this took place uh, many years ago. He's now 79 years old. And he's in a theater with a firearm, having a he has a concealed carry permit. Uh, as a former law enforcement officer yourself, what goes through your mind when you think about how this unfolded according to the evidence we've seen thus far? Well, first off, it's perfectly okay to have a concealed carry permit. And if anybody's going to have it, I would want a well-trained police officer to have it, somebody who's retired, who knows how to use the weapon and when to use the weapon, because there have been theater shootings before and bullets were sprayed, mm -hmm. and it was always good when a good guy with a gun was able to take care of that. However, in this particular case, I mean, it really upsets me the way it unfolded. And in addition to what Kurt said, the judge saying, I didn't see him reaching over, climbing over the seat. I thought the same exact thing. If Kurt Re Curtis Reeves believed that he was under a situation of receiving death or great bodily harm from Chad, from this, this uh, episode that was happening, this confrontation with the popcorn, if he believed that based on a furtherance, a furtherance would be, he jumped over the chair, he mounted me, he was pummeling me. Then I reached for my gun because he didn't get off me. I thought I was going to die. I'm 71 years old. I have arthritis, et cetera. All of that would have been justified. Mm -hmm. He would have been justified to do that. Being hit with a piece of popcorn and being upset is another thing. I, my thought was is that he they're trying to say you didn't investigate his claim enough, uh, Lisa, that he was just defending himself, that he was seriously afraid. Uh, that's like where I think he's trying to go with this. I'm not sure it's going to work. Uh, but do you think listening to this uh, as a police officer that they should have maybe asked him like, well, what do you mean? You you know, you said you're like bruised easily or whatever and you can't heal from that. But uh, do you think that the police should have maybe looked into that a little more? But like, well, what do you mean you were going to defend yourself, you know, other than saying he was scared? Yeah, well, yes, and I think that is important to his case of self-defense to show that he had medical issues and how far. He said that Curtis obviously volunteered everything about his bad back, his spine, his arthritis, um, his weight, et cetera. There's a reasonable expectation that somebody in their 70s is going to have arthritis. To expound upon it, I know a lot of seniors tend to like to talk about their various injuries, just from my own personal experience. So he did, <laughs> right. he shared it with, he did share it with him. So the fact that he didn't expound and say, well, tell me more about that and tell me about your shoes. And do you have a hard time tying your shoes? I think there's just a general consensus and expectation that somebody who has been part of police and SWAT, that their body is going to break down and at 71, it would be typical to have that. And I can agree with you. Um, I remember my grandmother, one of my grandmothers, when she was about 91, um, hearing about a lot of her ailments. And it, I don't think she really started talking about it till she was, you know, very old. But yeah, there are people that do like to tell people about their ailments, so um, who are elderly. Lisa, I was interested in that whole thing about the recreation, because when I, I hear about recreations or attempts to recreate a crime scene, it's usually because you're trying to figure out who did it. And in this case, that's not the issue. The issue is whether or not uh, the self-defense claim is valid um, under the law and whether or not the jury believes so. So, um, you know, a recreation to me, when you have all of these eyewitnesses on the stand testifying and giving statements, and then you have the videotape, it just seems like it, it could potentially be a waste of time. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Do it like every little thing in a case where you already know who the perpetrator is? Yeah, imagine the detectives go through school and training, obviously. So you go through a process of trying to do your best to cross every T, dot every I, did I do this, did I do that? And now he's in, in charge of the investigation, mm -hmm. so it was his case, and he had to pull everything together. Are police going to miss things? Absolutely. They're not perfect. They try to do the best that they can in most cases. Mm -hmm. And did he find a hole to poke to, into his credibility to say he didn't take the necessary uh, means available in order to find out if it was a true self-defense case because he didn't have a lot of experience, he finally relented and said, yes, that's very possible. That's the reason I didn't produce that. 
But does it show a shortcoming? Not so much because we did have the video footage and eyewitness testimony. I, yeah, I was a little bit um, stunned that he even brought up the whole thing about a recreation, even if he doesn't have experience in that. Um, you know, it, the, as I said, this is not a whodunit. So um, I guess maybe a recreation would be effective in a self-defense case. Uh, maybe we'll see one from the defense. Um, maybe that will be uh, something we see as they start their case, uh, which will happen on Friday morning at 830, and we'll have it covered for you. And just the fact, too, that he went and tried to help um, Chad Olson, too. I just, um, I can't even imagine being in that position. But obviously, uh, this was a guy who was very calm under pressure. Uh, Lisa, what did you uh, think of his testimony? Well, I think it's it was great. Um, as a police officer, I know when we have people help, citizens actually help other people, especially administering CPR mm -hmm. prior to uh, police and ambulance arriving. I mean, they really are heroes. They're willing to put themselves in danger to help somebody else out. And the character of this individual was just incredible, believable 100%. I felt that he, he was congruent and there was nothing that could have been, been said to rebut what he saw. He was going back into his memory. It was vivid it as you said as as he went step by step to describe what he saw what he heard he didn't plant words into their their mouth he says what i think i heard etc great witness lisa your take uh, on what this gentleman said i mean he's saying chad olson flipped the popcorn uh, there was a shot there was no um nothing else thrown there were no punches thrown by chad olson at curtis reeves i mean this is somebody who's who's clearly seeing what unfolded and he's not seeing any type of attack uh, other than this whole flipping of popcorn two witnesses back to back that we just saw and both of them corroborate the same exact thing and that is that they never saw a punch they never saw a cell phone being thrown and the shot was fired immediately after the popcorn was tossed so it completely goes against everything that Curtis Reeves said in the interview with the police officer, that I felt something coming at me, I saw the flash of the phone. Well, we know that Chad had the phone in his hand and everybody saw the light coming from Chad's phone. But in the end, it ended up being on the floor, the, the crime scene, when they picked it up, it was there. So certainly I would imagine after he was shot, he released it from his hand and it was dropped and it was found on the floor in that area. We have less than a minute left. I mean, probably about 30 seconds. Lisa, quickly, uh, do you think Curtis Reeves takes the stand? I think he should. I think that's the only thing that could potentially help him. He was very flat in his interview, but I think he needs to say what he needs to say regarding his true fear. We will be here uh, when and if he does, and we will bring it to you live, of course, as always. And the defense case uh, will begin at 8.30 Eastern tomorrow morning, Friday morning, and we'll have it covered for you. Kirk and Lisa, thanks to both of you uh, for your time as always and for your insight. We appreciate it. Have a great night.